from a, a total quality management type of business to a better done than perfect <laughs> approach. Uh, but uh, at the same time, well, that's the, the most. That's right. Uh, no, that's right. That's right. Most in, so maybe it's like in a startup in internet company. <laughs> right. And uh, I have got a lot of white hairs and uh, <laughs> each came from that slide. So uh, do you think there's, uh, there's a need to improve quality now that uh, we can actually leverage a customer feedback and we can learn from customers? And so I on? love this question, I'll tell you why. Because it, um, it, it perfectly captures the kind of dichotomy that I think many companies feel. We have to choose between quality management and getting it done. And now that we have a way for customers to tell us and, and control the quality for us, then maybe we don't have to do it ourselves the way we used to. And the answer to that is, look, if we wanna be, if we wanna offer customers really good experiences, then we have to be really trustable. And if we're gonna be really trustable, then we have to be able to do things right. So to the extent that we can get all the junk out, then okay, 95% uh, right and done may be better than 0% done. But 98% right is, is better. So, so if, we can, uh, if we can make it so that fewer and fewer customers have to, say, have to call us up and say, you sent the wrong thing, or no, or and, and, and up, up up in their own lives in order to make sure that we make some money, then we really need both of those. So the answer is that we have to find the right balance. Even though we don't spend as much time thinking about TQM anymore, I think the reason for that is really twofold. One is for the reason we're talking about, but the other reason is that TQM really grew up in an analog era. And it was part of the way that in analog world, uh, you could make sure that your that your product was working well on the assembly line. And that was really the way that you made sure it was perfect. We now have other ways of sort of seeing that things are perfect on the assembly line or other ways that we're making things that would, would make a difference. So I think that part of it is that we're sort of outgrowing that version of things, but also I think that we will never be able to relinquish it altogether and that we will always need to have some good version of doing things right as well as doing the right thing and doing them proactively. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, uh, social media have changed the way Really, brands, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> the way brands relate to customers sure. uh, and most of all vice versa. Sure. And uh, of course, uh, one of uh, your main theories is that one-to-one uh, -one marketing comes also with some legal help from social media. Right. Do you think it's just a positive impact on marketing strategy or you laugh? I don't want to be is it is a positive or negative um, uh, impact? The, the real question is not whether it's positive or negative because the answer to that is yes. And, um, and, the, and the reason I, I laugh is because we don't get to decide that. We don't, it's not really up to us to decide whether there will be social media, whether or not it will be impactful, whether or not it's positive or negative on us. What we have to do is do what we can to make the part that we're responsible for in our relationship with a customer and for her experience to make that as positive as possible. So in that sense, it's positive. And it's also a part of a way for us to um, sort of automatically gather data from individual customers who in many cases are actually identified to us, oh my gosh, that's the holy grail, and, uh, and we are able then to think in terms of, um, of how we get those customers to, um, to relate to us more, and they're gonna tell us how that's going to happen. Now, sometimes things go badly. So, for example, we, there was a, a, a story that we wrote in our book on trust, uh, the Extreme Trust book, where um, one of, one of the, um, the brands was showing how cool these women, these young women were who used their product. And to do it, they put a, a baby harness on a mother. So the, you, you can picture it, just the having the, you know, the harness on the front, and here's the baby. And the mother is doing cross-country skiing. And they put the ad out there, and 
the whole social media blew up over a weekend when they weren't watching because if you've ever been a mother, you would never do that in a million years. Not in a million years because no matter how good you think you are at skiing, you could fall and hurt that baby. Oh, and you'd be out in the middle of nowhere where you couldn't get, no, 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 that's just, that's, that's just a bad idea. So, um, and by Monday morning, it was a total disaster in terms of social media. So for them, it was a problem, but that was because they hadn't done it right. So they needed to think about, you know, they, they could have tried the idea out when they were watching. They could have tried it out in a small area, or they could have tried it on, in two ways and had the second way be, you know, something else. So, so in a way, I think positive and negative. It's, it's positive because you listen, but maybe negative if you are not able to manage. If it you're not, if you're not paying attention to it, you're not able to adjust your messages. Right, totally agree with that. <laughs> and thank you. And uh, last question: mm -hmm. uh, Is there a way, according to your experience, you've been studying uh, customer experience and probably the evolution of customer experience and probably the evolution of uh, how customers interact with brands. And uh, have you seen any trend emerging so that we can somehow predict what customers will be like in the future? Well, more predicted. paranoid, more picky, yeah. Yeah. more, more whatever, <laughs> more, and um, we have to be more well, We have better predictive tools than we've ever had, of course, yes. so we can use those in ways that we never dreamed of even 10 years ago, certainly not 20 years ago. Um, but in addition to that, though, we have to understand something, and that is that customers will become more and more demanding because they will become more of them like me. I'm the one who says, wait a minute, why should I work for you if you're not paying me? I'm paying you. <laughs> and, and right now, customers don't always think that way, right? But sooner or later, more of them will think that way. When that happens, then we can predict that their experiences, that they will, they will have higher and higher expectations of products and services and experiences. So I really do want for um, someone to say, I'm sorry, well, I, I hate it when they put me on hold, but, but your, your wait time will be three minutes, and then they just put me on hold with their choice of hold music. I should get to choose the hold music. I should get to choose my experiences. And uh, to the extent that, that that's practical. And, and so I think that it, I think we will get smarter and smarter about what customers will expect. And I think that the way we will stay ahead of the game is to understand what this customer expects and to see what's coming. So for example, if I'm an insurance company and you have a 14-year-old, then before that 14-year-old turns 16, and at least that's the driver's license age in the United States, I think it's way too low myself, but what is it here? 18. 18. But they are talking about a 16. No, they should, they should move it to 21. Make the drinking well, age 16. They, they, I mean, they should turn around. Now there are those little cars so with oh, number yeah. plates that are allowed to, to 16. Uh, yeah, right, so, right, right, right. Yeah. But don't let another 16 year old in the same car. But they, <laughs> because the, the IQ points will go down by half. Okay. And I say that in the most loving way because I have the greatest children in the world. But anyway, the, um, but I think that what we want is to make sure. Um, in, in that case, for example, I would say that the insurance um, adjuster, that my insurance guy called me when my child was 15, which he knew because he had the information, right? Now, his competitors didn't have that information, but he could call me and say, all right, you have two boys. They will total car, they will each total a car. We're, your hope is that they're not in it when it's total or they don't total themselves in the process. But since they're going to total a car, let's talk about how that won't cost you a fortune in insurance. And they did that so that before his 16th birthday, um, the, either one of them, both of them, um, my sons, they, I was already locked into a plan. So at that point, anybody else who tried to get hold of me would not have been any, they wouldn't have had any luck doing it. And I would have thought, well, you know, who are you to, to try to, to help? I, I'm, I need to be with my friend who's helping me with this stuff, <laughs> who knows about kids totaling cars. So, um, you know, you recommended which ones to get and how you don't take out the, uh, you only take out the liability insurance and you just went, I've only had one total one car, but uh, we didn't have any, anything on it. We just wrote it off and got another car. So, um, so that, that was a help to me because I could have, I might've insured that car for, you know, a lot more money. I had a different car that's harder to replace. So that ability to do that kind of thing for a customer is going to have a lot to do with where we're going with this and predicting what this customer wants is even more valuable than being able to predict 
what all of my customers want.